One of the things that my wife and I and our family uh, love to do, and it's become pretty much a yearly thing now, is we love to go explore uh, the cities around Lake Michigan. We love to go uh, to Michigan and just camp and uh, swim in Lake Michigan. Oh, but it's cold sometimes. It's just so beautiful and picturesque there. And if you've ever been to any of the Great Lakes, uh, Lake, Lake Superior, um, Lake Michigan, you'll know that uh, littered on the coast is these things called lighthouses. And usually these lighthouses are at strategic points where uh, historically there's been wrecks there or maybe just as an act of prevention, they place the lighthouse so that ships uh, that are coming near to shore can gauge their distance and can navigate and, and be warned on what's there. And, you know, we've been able to visit some of these lighthouses and the kids love to walk out over the water and, and maybe even climb up in the lighthouse and see how far. And I've learned a few things about lighthouses, though, and that here's a few things is that lighthouses are often built at a higher elevation. They're tall or they're on tall places. In fact, some of them are over 200 feet tall, and that is uh, so that they, they can be, be seen, and that the light inside lighthouses is uh, on, off, on, off at a rate of 10 seconds to 15 second rotation. So on, off, on, off. And that's the way that the, the ships can differentiate that it, it's a lighthouse because of its regular consistency and rhythm. But I'm often curious about how um, they're able to project the light so far. And I found out that most uh, lighthouses have a, a, a light bulb that's only about a thousand watts. And so how do you get a thousand watts of light all the way out over the water in, in the, the answer is they have a special uh, uh, lens that the light is projected through that's filled with all kinds of prisms, and all kinds of uh, different ways, but in perfect alignment that allows the, the light to be filtered and projected uh, right around 22 miles out over the water, over the curvature of the earth so that the ships can see that. I just thought, man, what a range of light. But it's all capable because of alignment. In fact, you could say that if there's no alignment, then there's no distance. And if anything in the prism gets out of alignment, it diminishes the distance of the light. Man, when I heard that, I'm like, man, that's a sermon. You know, I'm a pastor, so everything's, there's a sermon in anything. And I thought about in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's given this great discourse, this phenomenal sermon, and then he, he talks about how uh, we are uh, like a city set upon a hill, a lamp on a lampstand. And we are, in essence, his lighthouse uh, to the world. This is echoed even in Exodus 19, right before God gives uh, the Ten Commandments. He tells the Israelites, hey, you're going to be my treasured possession. You're going to be my special people. I will proclaim my name through you to the nations of the world. In essence, you, Israelites, are going to be my, my lighthouse. And then he gives us the Ten Commandments. And I just thought about this, is the Ten Commandments in the Scripture are the way that we live our lives. We love God, love ourselves, love others. But they're also, when we're in alignment with them, then the light of God, the glory of God can shine through us to our neighbors, our communities, and ultimately to the nations of the world. But it all comes down to alignment because if there's no alignment, then you know it, there's no distance. We want to increase the distance of our impact. And now we're looking at the second Ten Commandment, uh, or of the Ten Commandments. Last week we looked at number one, have no other gods before me. Let's read in Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6, the second of the Ten Commandments. And it reads as follows. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, Ooh, punishing the children for sin, the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. 
of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You know, in the noise, if you will, that surrounded, that was pervasive in the culture when the Israelites were, were set free from bondage in Egypt was one that was filled with idols. They, they were leaving a, an empire that worshipped over 400, 450 different idols. And they're going into an idol-worshipping promised land. And so they were surrounded by a plurality, if you will, a multitude of gods. There was the god of weather. There was the god of fertility. There was the god of harvest. I mean, the, you name it, the god of power, the god of sex, I mean, the god of, of money. It was everything. And so when God gives this command that, number one, uh, you are only going to serve one God, that's me, Yahweh, and you are to make no idols, no, no, no carved image, no man-made images of me. That would have been so countercultural because not only were there a plurality of gods, but they had all kinds of images of those gods that they would make and carry around with them. And God separates them with this one command and says, hey, number one, you're going to have no other gods but me, and there's no image there. And there's no substitutes for me. And you know what's ironic about this, though, is that the moment that God is speaking to Moses this, this commandment, the Israelites, under the leadership of Aaron, the second in command, uh, they were, uh, the people were tired of waiting. They said, hey, listen, this is taking too long. Moses is up there talking to God, and man, we, 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 what, what's happening down here? We, we need to take matters into our own hands. And the Scripture says that they... They, they said, hey, we'll give you all the gold. We'll throw it into the fire and make for us two images. And that's exactly what Aaron does. He, he crafts two golden calves and, and, and to the image of, of Yahweh. And you know, it's, it's just interesting that they, they weren't, the text seems to indicate that they weren't going to leave Yahweh. No, no. Uh, they just uh, wanted Yahweh on their own terms. It's like they were saying by making that, they were making those images. We, we still want Yahweh, but we want Yahweh our way. And, and I think, man, there's a danger of that. And this is what God was alluding to. Because when we remix God, when we uh, do that, what, what part of God do you include in the idol that you're making? And the tendency is we only include the parts that we are familiar with or that we like. None of the stuff that we don't know or that we don't agree with. So... I mean, if you think God is big, you'll make it big. If you think he's royal, you'll make it with gold. And I've heard people say similar things like, that. oh man, I'm into the New Testament Jesus. I'm not into the Old Testament Jesus. I'm into the New Testament grace. I don't want any of that judgment of sin stuff. Or I'm into that prosperity side of things, man. Listen, I just leave out the cross. Jesus suffered. I don't ever have to suffer. So I leave out all the suffering. You can see how left to our own devices, we, we begin to fashion God in our own Im image. And maybe the heart of that was this. Uh, we want to bring a God that we can carry with us, a God that we can control, a God that we can, we can see and bring Him closer to us. When in reality, they got it wrong because we don't bring God closer to us. God, what does He do? He brings us closer to Him. And I just love what, what God's re response, and, and it was in the text because what He said was, He said, oh, I'm a jealous God. He said, don't make any idols because I'm jealous. Now, when I read that, you're thinking, I thought it was a sin to be jealous. And so how can God be jealous? And, 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 you know, like you see in the scriptures, jealousy doesn't lead to a lot of good things. I mean, you got Saul and David. I mean, you remember when they came back uh, from battle, it said, they sang that Saul is slain as thousands and David tens of thousands. And immediately Saul gets jealous and man, it just wrecks everything and, so jealousy often doesn't have a good outcome. You know, when you think about that, though, that, that must mean that there's two kinds of jealousy. And there is. There's a worldly jealousy, and then there's a godly jealousy. And the worldly jealousy always wants something from you. But a godly jealousy always wants something for you. You see, uh, when we're jealous because we want something, we want somebody's notoriety, we want their fame, we want their objects, we want their life, we want the, the ease, the comfort, we want something from them they have that we want to take. And that, that's always wrong. But 
There is a jealousy that's godly in the sense that I want something for you so bad that I don't want you to, to miss this great blessing for your life. And that's the heart of what God is saying here. Some scholars even allude to this text and, and say that it's, you know, it's like God is saying he's seeing his uh, spouse. We talked about that last week, that, that God entered a covenant relationship. And now he's seeing when they formed idol worship, the Israelites had said that they would commit the act of adultery. God was alluding. It's like they are in the arms, seeing your wife in the arms or your spouse in the arms of another lover. So there is, there is this, like, I, I, there's a, in the sovereignty of God, he can see the outcome. And he says, listen, if you, if you do this, it's going to destroy you. And I want more for you than that. So I'm jealous for you. And I just, I just think that that's the heart of what this is, is that God can see all the limitations of our decisions, all the things, the outcomes. And he's saying, don't go down that road. Don't do this. Uh, you need to to accept me as I am and don't remix me and reduce me to a God that you can control and only a God that is consumed with your happiness. I like what C.S. Lewis, in response to these thoughts, he said, I think what we want is not a heavenly father, but a heavenly grandparent, a grandfather. And I thought, you know, and how often that is the case. We don't want a parent, but we want a grandparent. And let me tell you how this plays out in my life and, and see if I can make this a, a reality here is that, have you ever like, if you're a parent and maybe you experienced this as a kid, you're, I, you know, I give, I can remember giving my, my, you know, we decide, hey, we're not gonna get our kids a ton of presents because number one, I don't have to store them. And number two, I, you know, they just don't need all this stuff. And, and, and we'd, we'd rather give them experiences than presents. And so we go home for Christmas and you say, you know, mom, listen, we don't want presents for the kids, just maybe one, two, but not a whole lot. And then, you, you know, you also make a decision. They're not going to eat sweets. We don't want a lot of sweets, maybe a treat here and there. But, man, listen, we're going to eat healthy in our home. We're going to, man, listen, they're going to keep all the teeth. But you take them to grandma's house or grandpa's house, and it seems like the rules don't apply. You drop them off, and next thing you know, you come back, and you've got a carload, a trunk full, a house full of presents. I said two, and they got 200. I mean, listen, we left some of the presents one year wrapped. We got so many and just gave them to kids for birthday parties. Hey, you got to go pick a present and give it away. I mean, there were presents everywhere in that house. Or you, you come home and you send no sugar and the kids look like they're, they're floating across the room and they're, ah, they've had more Kool-Aid and, and cookies than you can count. And it just seems like they're not worried about the rules. They're just worried about, you know, the happiness of the kid. They're not worried about the long term. They're worried about the short term. And I think sometimes... That's the danger of reducing God to, to an idol, an image that we control and that we create, is that we, we, we want more of a grandparent that's just consumed with our happiness. And we're not interested in a God who wants to transform our identity and ultimately lead us into freedom. And that's really at the heart of this, is yes, God's going to bless our lives. Yes, God's going to give us joy, but ultimately... He's shown us how to love him because he wants us to walk in a new identity and ultimately a new freedom. So how about it, church? Not only do we have no other gods before him, but let's, let's not make and reduce God into an image. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. And just create a moment where you're at, if you don't mind, a posture of humility, hands out in front of you. I want to speak first of uh, to those who have yet to receive Christ and and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. And I just want to encourage you, maybe I just want to say that God's jealous for you. And maybe you've wandered from different idol to different idol in your life and different substitute to different substitute. And maybe, maybe your experience has been just, I'm just going to do it myself. But in reality, it's always left you empty and searching and wanting why not surrender your life to Jesus Christ today? And for the first time, bring your life into alignment with who he is and his will. And I want to encourage you today to pray a surrendering prayer. And in prayer of invitation, inviting Jesus to be Lord of your life. To, to become your Lord and Savior and ultimately let his light begin to shine through you. If that's you, begin to pray now. Humble yourself and ask Jesus to save you. Let me speak to those who are already in Christ. And there's always a temptation in us to uh, remix God and to, 
to have our own version of Christianity and to leave out the cross and to leave out who he is. And maybe you realize that today and you just need to get into alignment again. It's so easy for things to get out of alignment. But today you realize maybe God's indicating some areas in your life where you're out of alignment. And, and, and you just need to humble yourself again and, and, and say, Lord, I repent and bring your, your life back into alignment with him so that his light can shine through you more clearly and more fully. Maybe your relationship with God has been consumed about your happiness rather than your identity in him and ultimately the freedom that he wants to bring to your life. And if you say, hey man, I'd like him to shape my identity again and I'd like to walk in new levels of freedom, we'll invite him to do just that and make a commitment to trust him as he is, not as you would want him to be. So Father, I thank you as people are praying you're, you're saving people today, but you're also, you're bringing us back into alignment with you. That's what I love about these Ten Commandments, especially these first two. God, it's it's putting you first and it's like it, and letting God be God in my life again. And get, it's, it's me getting in alignment with him, not reducing him to who I want him to be. And maybe you just realize that today. You, you need to make things right with him again and get alignment again. That's awesome. Just repent, humble yourself. Ask for his mercy, ask for his forgiveness, and say, God, I'm getting in alignment with you. God, do an aligning work in this series, this Ten Commandments, and may your light shine through us to the nations of the world.